Okay, it's time to get started. I would like to thank you so much for joining us for what promises to be an enlightening hour with two stellar innovators in biomaterials, Molly Stevens and Ali Karam Husseini. Uh, my name is Stephanie Brock and I'm a professor of chemistry at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. I'm also an associate editor of Chemistry of Materials and the deputy editor of the new Gold Open Access Community Journal, ACS Materials Gold. ACS Materials Gold is one of nine community journals recently launched by the ACS to ensure that you have the opportunity to, first of all, publish in respected and impactful journals while conforming to any funding agency requirements, and second of all, to share your work globally, ensuring anyone who wants to read it can do so. As such, we are committed to showcasing your best work in materials research to the global community and providing unrestricted access to cutting edge research at the forefront of the discipline. I'm pleased to be co-hosting here today with Rodney Priestley, representing Jax Gold. Rodney. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Princeton. Um, my name is Rod Priestley. I'm also an associate editor of Jax Gold. I'm also the Dean of the Graduate School and the Pomeroy and Betty Perry Smith Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering at Princeton University. I'd like to welcome you to the Grand Challenges in Material Science, Innovators in Bioengineering, again hosted by Jax Gold and ACS Materials Gold. In brief, Jax Gold seeks to build upon the greatest attributes of the Journal of the American Chemical Society. However, Jax Gold is open access meaning that all articles are open to the community despite subscription status. We seek to publish articles in the broad field of chemistry, including new materials development to advance technologies in bioengineering. This is why we are so excited to be co-hosting this webinar, and we certainly hope that you will enjoy it. Now, before we get started, I'd like to remind all of the uh, members in, in attendance to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom to post your questions and we will ask questions after both Molly and Ali have made their presentations. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this Grand Challenges in Materials webinar. Molly Stevens is Professor of Biomedical Materials and Regenerative Medicine in the Department of Materials and Department of Bioengineering and the Research Director of Biomedical Materials Sciences at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at Imperial College, London. She joined Imperial College in 2004 as a lecturer. After postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Professor Langer in chemical engineering at MIT. Prior to that, she graduated from Bath University with first class honors in pharmaceutical sciences and was then awarded a PhD from the laboratory of biophysics and surface analysis from the University of Nottingham in 2000. The Stevens Group is a multidisciplinary research group of students postdocs and research fellows. They use innovative bioengineering approaches to pursue their vision of solving key problems in regenerative medicine and biosensing. Their research spans drug delivery, bioactive materials, tissue engineering, biosensing, materials characterization, soft robotics, and the interface between living and non-living matter. Professor Stevens is a fellow of eight UK societies, including the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering. And in 2019, she was an elected foreign member of the National Academy of Engineering in the US. She holds numerous leadership positions, too many to name, but I'll highlight a few, including director of the UK Regenerative Medicine Platform Smart Materials Hub, and is an editor of ACS Nano. Professor Stevenson has also been recognized um, quite extensively for her research, including 30 or more prestigious awards, including the ACTA Biomaterial Silver Medal in 2020 and the Imperial College President's Award and Medal for Outstanding Research Team. Molly, it is a pleasure to welcome you. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, uh, Rodney, and thanks so much for uh, inviting me to this um, event. I'm really, really excited to be here. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the, the uh, advantages of having it virtual, actually, is we can have people from all around the world attending, which is um, uh, also great. So um, 
I've been uh, asked to um, speak a little bit uh, from a quite a personal perspective about some of the uh, challenges that we're facing um, in material science and in particular how innovations in bioengineering could uh, impact on those. Um, and my group um, really is, is pretty broad. Um, and I thought what I'd do today is focus on a couple of examples of why this is important in therapeutics and biosensing. And so I, I've picked really just, just three kind of um, points really that I wanted to make uh, in this talk. And the, the first one uh, that I see as a, a sort of challenge where we can impact through, through bioengineering and through new material systems is, is really thinking about how we can do very safe and effective translation. And so uh, really being able to impact on the patient well-being. Um, second area I'll touch on uh, in this really uh, brief talk is uh, thinking about how we can understand single nanoparticles better, because I think if we can do that, we can design them much better. And that's important for loads and loads of different therapeutic applications. And then third point, which is something that's really important to me, is how can we actually make technologies that can benefit the most people possible? So how can we help in thinking right from the start of the design about how we're going to democratize that access to the healthcare innovation. So, so this is my group. You can see they're really uh, diverse in that they come from all around the world, but actually they're, they're very multidisciplinary as well. So even though I'm joined between a materials department and a bioengineering department, we also have lots of chemists uh, in the group. We have surgeons in the group, mathematicians, physicists, uh, all those different backgrounds, I think, are one of the things that enables actually us to tackle key challenges in research. The other thing the other thing that I think is really important in making sure that research can have really uh, good impact um, is to make sure that we don't stray too far from incorporating fundamental science impacts into that research. And so within our group, we work both on fundamental science, but also right through to applied innovations. And if we think about therapeutics and whether that's regenerative medicine or just therapeutics more uh, broadly, there's groups all around the world uh, working on repairing, for example, different tissues and also tackling many different uh, diseases. In our um, group focuses mostly on the musculoskeletal system and also cardiovascular and the eye, um, but really a lot of the work we do around materials platforms can be applied to many different organ systems. Um, and one of the things, it, particularly if we look at regenerative medicine, um, one of the things that material scientists um, like, like people within uh, my group, but also more broadly struggle with is, is thinking about how much complexity do you encode into a material system? Because you could start with a rather simple system, uh, but that might not provide enough information for cells and you can in include uh, more complexity, but that might make it more difficult to translate. And we have also, um, had some examples from within the field of materials that have translated in, in slightly unsafe ways. And so we want to um, really um, be thinking about how uh, can we make the best possible uh, materials to regenerate the most lifelike uh, tissue in the best possible way, uh, but in a way that's uh, going to be cost effective and also really safe for the patient. So that's quite a complicated challenge to do, particularly if you're uh, based within a, a university department. And so we uh, bring on help to do that. What we've done in the UK is we've set up um, this UK regen uh, regenerative medicine program, uh, Smart Materials Hub, and that enables us to bring uh, expertise from across 10 different universities in the UK. I'm currently serving as the director of this. And we make different materials, um, whether we're using 3D uh, printing approaches, which I know um, Ali will talk a little bit about uh, later in this session, uh, or gel type systems or gradient materials or um, indeed nanoscale structured materials, all of these different material structures we make. But we also have set up panels within this hub to bring on regulatory experts and uh, safety and immunology experts and people that can advise us around manufacturing. And so really thinking about how we train our early career researchers from being great scientists um, right to thinking about the target product profiles of the kind of materials they're going to end up using so that these can translate. And I'm really uh, delighted that the hub is involved now in a number of human, uh, setting up a number of human clinical trials to 
um, make sure that materials that are uh, designed uh, with great science in mind also make it through to helping patients. So uh, second point I want to um, mention is about uh, understanding single nanoparticles better. Now, why does this matter? So you can see here a number of different nanoparticles that are used um, at the moment in lots of research fields and also started be, to be translated to the clinic. So you have, for example, viral vectors, um, you have uh, lipid-based nanoparticles. Um, we have a few of these uh, now also um, becoming really interesting candidates for vaccines, for example. And you also have tiny particles that are released from cells. These are called exosomes. Uh, all, all cells release these and they're really interesting uh, for therapy, but also for diagnosis. And then you can have other polymer type particles and really lots of different types of nanoparticles available to deliver therapeutics or, or to be used in biosensing. And on the right, you can just see uh, some of those particles that we've um, been developing within our own group just in the last couple of years. Um, I've just put some very recent publications to show that um, this is an active area for us. And so with this being an active area, one of the frustrations we were getting was how can you actually study these particles better uh, at the single particle <clears throat> excuse me level to understand for example cargo loading or chemistry and and really be able to design ultimately these particles better and we were uh, quite frustrated that uh, uh, about not having a technique available that could do this for us and so we invented a technique within our own lab um, this is called SPARTA, Single Particle Automated Raman Trapping Analysis. And what SPARTA can do is it can use an optical trap to trap an individual nanoparticle and measure its chemistry. And so we can then learn about its composition and how the particles functionalized, and we can correlate that to the size of individual particles as well. So do a simultaneous size measurements and even measure real time dynamic reactions on the surface. And this is all powered by our own um, software and coding that we've written um, in an instrument that you can now use at the touch of a button. And so this enables us essentially to measure chemistry within single particles that you would never normally be able to uh, distinguish if you were uh, performing uh, a bulk measurements. And so you can really pull out heterogeneity that you wouldn't normally be able to. And you can see what the, the prototype instrument looks like in the, the top right there. But I'll just show you a couple of things that you, we can do with it. Um, so here we have on the top uh, uh, row, we have um, two different types of liposomes, some deuterated ones and some non-deuterated. And you can look at a mixed population of these with the sparta and without having to label them or anything, you can pull out um, uh, differences in their chemistry. And then at the bottom, we have two different types of polymerosomes made from polymer chains that are rather similar, except the blue one uh, also incorporates a heparin group. And again, without having to label these, you can uh, measure that mixed population and distinguish between those two different kinds of um, particles. Um, what we're showing uh, in this image here is how we can also measure dynamic reactions, um, dynamic processes on individual particles, uh, which I think is really, really exciting um, in terms of some of the things we can now study using this approach. And the exemplar that I've shown here is where we're trapping um, at the top left in panel A, um, an, an individual polystyrene particle, and we perform the first chemical reaction to introduce an, introduce an alkyne group. And this shows up with really nice characteristic peak in the Raman spectra. And then we can do a second reaction to convert this to a triazole. And so you then see a decrease in the alkyne peak and an increase in the triazole. And you can monitor that for individual particles and really follow those reactions, uh, which is very, uh, very exciting. Um, uh, yes, so um, this is just showing you also how you can um, use SPARA to identify um, where exosomes are coming from. So these are these uh, small vesicles that are released from cells. They're also released from cancer cells and actually know that their biochemistry is different if they come from a cancer cell or from a healthy cell. 
And so it's really uh, interesting to be able to trap these uh, with the sparta and uh, analyze their chemical composition. And we've done this for many different types of exosomes from different types of cancers um, versus healthy cells and also cancers that have a particular drug resistance, for example. Um, and this has recently been published um, in this ACS uh, journal, ACS Nano, in fact, um, and you can get down to about 95% sensitivity and specificity. So this is interesting in terms of diagnosis, but also potentially because people are really interested in using these exosomes uh, for therapy because they can contain really interesting biological information to help in signaling within cells. And then final um, example I'm going to show you uh, for Sparta is this one here, which has just been um, accepted. Uh, so this has just appeared um, online. And this is where we can use Sparta to uh, trap um, uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles. And this is really interesting because these um, are including uh, in some of the uh, COVID vaccines are emerging as really uh, interesting uh, new um, or at least newly uh, applied in the clinic, um, nanoparticle systems. Um, and there's still a need really to understand how the composition of these uh, relates to uh, their function uh, in vivo, so we can do even better design. And so what we did in this study here was to look at uh, lipid nanoparticles that had different uh, compositions, um, and also to look at their interaction with an enzyme called phospholipase D. And that's interesting because phospholipase D is um, uh, uh, produced within, within the body, uh, also in particular sites and in relation to particular uh, diseases. And so we can start to understand how these kind of particles that would have a biological function in the body would be affected uh, by this enzyme and actually monitor that in real time and see how the uh, lipids on these um, particles are converted, in this case, from DOPC to uh, DOPA. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of field, um, this is yeah, very recently um, published uh, work. And, and so we see this kind of technology actually being really transformative for the way that you can study um, nanoparticles that are going to be used in therapy. Um, it could be used early in formulation development, but also throughout the manufacturing process development, and ultimately also uh, within manufacturing quality control. So very last thing that I want to touch on just in a, a, a couple of minutes is um, democratization of access to healthcare innovations. Now, access to innovations that can tell us about early disease detection are important for pretty much every disease. So from cancers to heart disease to viruses and antimicrobial resistance. And we can use nanoparticles in the context of biosensing. We do a lot of work on this, and we particularly think about how we functionalize the surface of these uh, biomarkle um, uh, nanoparticles. And um, we really want to um, be able to have these technologies have the most impact possible across the world. And infectious disease actually is really disproportionately affecting um, low-income countries at the moment, as I'm sure you'll be aware. And so one of the ways, uh, one of the challenges, the challenges, uh, this um, sort of unfairness really of the way that technologies are deployed across the world, but the uh, kind of innovation that can help with that is thinking about how we can also use technologies that can be read uh, by mobile phones. And this is because um, there's about 7 billion uh, global mobile um, uh, phone subscriptions now. It's really a very interesting way of thinking about how we can connect and empower people across the world. You can see here from um, our, our recent um, um, Nature paper that uh, we looked at growing smartphone adoption across the world. Um, and uh, as you'll no, uh, the, the number of smartphones available are, are increasing across the world, but actually also in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's not just the number of phones, it's also the quality of those phones and how well they can take um, photographs. 
And so we looked, for example, here uh, at this study um, in uh, looking at data from Uganda um, at how easy it was for uh, people to get access to a healthcare facility versus to uh, mobile phone coverage. And not surprisingly, you're going to be able to access far more people uh, and bring technology to them if that technology can be read by mobile phone out in the community rather than need to be done in a more centralized healthcare uh, facility. So it can really help us with access um, of democratization of access to healthcare. And we've set up this center called iSense that looks right at uh, tracking of diseases. This is led by uh, Professor Ingemar Cox. Um, uh, ultra-sensitive biosensing and integration into online care pathways. I'm currently the deputy director of that center. And I'm just gonna show you just two examples of how we've applied this. One is to detect HIV very early on. And to do that, you need to detect the virus itself. In this case, uh, protein from the virus called P24. We use state-of-the-art nanoparticles that we develop um, in my lab that have a gold core and a porous platinum shell. And these can act essentially as artificial, a bit like artificial enzymes, they're called nanozymes. And they can create this really vibrant color when you add some uh, chemicals to them or, or dark color, I should say, when you add some chemicals to them. And you can functionalize them with antibodies that will recognize that P24. And we then have a separate tiny uh, binder called a nanobody that has a biotin group on it, and that can also bind to P24. So when you mix these together, and then you run them up a, a test strip, so this is like a lateral flow test, like you'll have seen for the COVID lateral flow test, um, that biotin binds very quickly to streptavidin at the surface, and we can then capture those nanoparticles, add the chemicals, and actually get a hundredfold amplification. So this is a hundredfold better uh, than the gold nanoparticle-based lateral flow tests. And actually, at the time we published this back in 2018, was the uh, most sensitive point of care um, uh, test that had been developed for HIV. And you can see it gets right into that acute stage. So uh, we're working closely with partners in uh, Africa to look at how we can um, deploy these technologies. And this uh, video will just show you, um, yeah, these are some of the readers that have been uh, made by the uh, McKendry group in iSense, where you can uh, essentially take uh, tests, um, put them in with these vestigial markers, take photographs of them, get really robust output. And then we can create, again, within iSense, these data dashboards that uh, look at mapping of uh, technology so that we can get people quickly into online care um, pathways. And then very final um, uh, slide that I want to uh, show you, uh, just to be respectful of the, the time that I've been allocated is this one here, which is um, where we uh, developed a point of care test that could um, distinguish between three different strains of Ebola uh, in survivors of Ebola. So this is looking at serological surveillance, so looking at the antibodies um, produced by the patients. And um, we took this uh, out to Uganda. This is, again, um, uh, back a few years ago now, so kind of pre-pandemic and um, or pre-COVID pandemic, I should say. Uh, and you can see the um, uh, the mapping here um, within about a hundred looked at about a hundred survivors here and could just distinguish really well uh, between them and also do a geotagged um, mapping of, of where they were um, located and um, I'm just so delighted really to see how um, this kind of approach and technology has now become much more routine uh, with the current pandemic, because I, I think it's so incredibly important in terms of being able to track infectious disease spread and, and to much better control um, the, um, the way that we respond to that, as we've seen. So it's, it's wonderful um, to see uh, more and more people now adopting these kind of uh, approaches. And I'll um, stop there and just, again, thank uh, my group and uh, collaborators and, um, uh, and also uh, all of you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, it's really exciting to see how we can sort of exploit uh, some of these new technologies um, that you've developed with, with uh, robust cell phone technologies. 
um, to really sort of globalize uh, the impact of the, of the work that's being done. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I would like to take a moment to introduce our second speaker, Ali Karam Hosseini. Dr. Karam Hosseini obtained his undergraduate and master's degrees in chemical engineering from the University of Toronto. Uh, he went to MIT and also worked with uh, Dr. Langer, where he secured a PhD degree in bioengineering in 2005. Uh, basically, immediately after, he was snapped up at Harvard Medical School, so he didn't have to go very far, with additional appointments at Harvard, MIT's Division of Health Sciences and Technology, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the Vice Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. In 2017, he was lured across the country to UCLA as the Levi Knight Professor of Bioengineering, Chemical Engineering, and Radiology, and he founded and served as director of the Center for Minimally Invasive Therapeutics. Presently, Dr. Karim Husseini is the CEO of the UCLA-affiliated Terasaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. Uh, Dr. Karim Husseini is recognized worldwide as, as, as an innovator in bioengineering solutions to precision medicine. He does this by working closely with clinicians who are patient-facing in order to develop personalized remedies that are both practical and affordable to a variety of these uh, disease states. So that echoes some of the, some of the work that, that Molly is doing in terms of democratization. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not go through the 60 plus major awards that he's received in acknowledgement of his achievements, but will point out that he is perpetually on Thomson Reuters list of highly cited researchers and the world's most influential minds. Ali, thanks again for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Brock. Um, and thank you, everyone. Really appreciate the opportunity for um, presenting some of our work, particularly in what I see as some of the grand challenges in material science as it pertains to applications related to tissue engineering and drug delivery. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. And um, as Molly mentioned, we have we have a lot of um, uh, we have a lot of interdisciplinary work in our lab and. Uh, uh, at the Institute. Um, so this is a typical um, typical meeting that we have. And uh, you can kind of just see from the, uh, from the close that we have a lot of different backgrounds. Of course, we have clinicians and scientists, whether they're chemists or physicists, um, as well as, um, as, well as uh, many other uh, types of folks, engineers of different sorts. Um, and um, uh, and I, I think that we're, uh, where we're really benefit is having uh, this interdisciplinary interactions um, to address a range of problems. And, um, and similar to Molly's, our group is also uh, very international um, from all over the place. And we, are, we pride ourselves um, a lot based on that diversity. Um, before I start, I also like to thank our uh, funding sources and encourage every guy, um, everyone to uh, connect with us through different uh, sorts of uh, platforms, whether it's Twitter or, or et cetera. Um, so the institute that I'm currently um, running is um, is an institute that's located in Los Angeles, uh, which is um, a beautiful area. This is our third building, which is going to be up and running in the next uh, few months. And really, the focus of the institute is translation, and our pet peeve is to become the world's best place for academic entrepreneurs. So really uh, focusing on trying to uh, develop technologies that can be translated into uh, companies that actually have impact in uh, human life. Um, one of the things that um, um, we, we, are, um, we do is very diverse area of research, um, all related to materials and um, using materials to, to um, really push forward a lot of different applications. And these are from areas related to making materials that can be used for um, surgical applications and different types of medical um, types of um, materials. Um, and these materials uh, are designed to tailor to an individual's need, whether that's a biomechanical or a biochemical um, um, stimuli and become um, to some degree responsive to what uh, that individual needs. We also work a lot on another aspect of materials, which is really using materials for devices and using things like flexible electronics and uh, sensors to enable advances to 
existing medical uh, devices, whether they would be wound healing uh, patches or catheters or other types of things. Uh, we combine these different materials with cells, particularly immune cells and stem cells that can be used to um, um, add additional functionality. And we use these types of technologies in, in different test beds, whether they're in making different types of implants or tissues uh, for, um, for patients as needed, um, being able to make different sorts of um, lab on a chip, organ on a chip models, or what we call microphysiological systems, as well as uh, something that I've become particularly interested in is using these sorts of technologies for um, nutrition applications, things like um, using um, these techniques for making lab-grown um, meats, as well as other sorts of uh, more environmentally friendly um, alternatives to animal agriculture. So um, what uh, I'm gonna quickly talk about is one of the challenges, which is which I see that ability to use uh, materials in controlling cell behavior and by doing that, being able to use the architecture of the materials as well as its um, its chemical um, and biological properties. So over the years, we've been very much interested in this architecture, whether this, that, that would be through making porous scaffolds or lithographic and micro uh, engineering approaches, fluidics systems to make um, structures, fibers and self-assembly. But over, over the past few years, really bioprinting has uh, taken, uh, taken off and has become a particularly uh, a useful um, approach to do this. When it comes to bioprinting, I think what I want to mention is that bioprinting is an approach where we put the cells and materials in close proximity to each other. We actually print them so that they can actually, the cells can actually do the rest of the work. So uh, what the goal is to not necessarily make the tissue at uh, time zero, but allow the cells to reorganize and become more mature and functional um, through this process and be able to make tissues that are more and more like um, real tissue architectures. So we worked on a couple different areas here. One is actually the materials, the inks that are used to um, make this process more efficient and effective. And there's a variety of different materials that we've been working on. Um, all of them involve uh, to some degree hydrogel materials. These are hyd hydrated polymers. Um, and what we see, um, for example, is um, we can make um, inks that are to some degree very simple, but act as a very powerful uh, baseline to be able to have cells reorganize their environment. So these materials, for example, photocrossable gelatin are now very widely used because of its ability to provide a blank slate that the cells can degrade and um, actually they can adhere to. Um, the other thing um, is to use um, techniques like um, um, universal inks. These are inks that can be printed with many different types of um, uh, printers and allows us to, again, have this uh, diverse ability to control the material properties and other types of inks that are conductive or oxygen generating so that we can actually control uh, different aspects of material properties. Now, what I've told you so far are basically one category of um, inks. And typically, bioprinters or 3D printers in general are designed to print one material. And if you're trying to make more, uh, more complex structures, you have to have multiple nozzles, typically, which makes it a lot more complex. A few years ago, we started to think about these processes, and we were bio, um, we got uh, bio inspired by um, looking at how nature generates complexity in the tissues that it's, it's um, generating and in materials that it's making. So, for example, one of the fascinating things is a spider and how it can basically take uh, the com components of different glands that it has in its back and be able to spin out um, basically a silk of a unique property that it wants. Uh, we can get this inspiration and build microfluidic systems that mimic this. Uh, for example, here being able to make these uh, channels which are all um, pneumatically controlled with a, um, a computer controlled system. And based on which of these materials are, are being um, expressed based on which channels are open, we can start controlling what uh, materials are expressed and be able to have lots of control over the uh, these types of systems. 
So just to um, give you an example, if you have like three different materials with um, red, green, and blue inside them and you open them sequentially, then all of these will be open in the same region of the fiber. If you, if you open them all uh, simultaneously, then they all will be expressed in the same region. So by doing this, you can now start making lots of a bit, um, controlled architectures. You can um, get more um, deep in your engineering. You can, by having the same uh, channels, but having different flow regimes, you can change not only the chemical composition, but also the topography of these structures. You can make uh, layers uh, or systems that have um, controlled architectures and even have multi-phase systems where you can have air bubbles, um, oil droplets, or even cells embedded in these uh, architectures. So one of the things we're very much interested in is to actually use these in, in different applications. And one of the obvious ones is to be able to make these um, uh, fibers embedded with cells of different kinds um, and be able to use them in a minimally invasive regenerative applications. So here, for example, we can make these fibers so that they have cells, particularly in this case, this the core can have hepatocytes, liver cells, and the shell here can have support cells that which maintain the functions of these liver cells. And we can um, test these and we can deliver them inside, um, inside um, different uh, cases um, through a pinhole. Um, the other thing we can do is actually have these fibers be coded in a way that they can uh, control the surrounding biology. Here, um, these fibers can release some particular molecule that can be a chemoattractant, for example, here to neutrophils um, and many other sorts of things. And of course, it doesn't take too much now to take this and put it upstream from bioprinters, uh, the, the nozzles, and be able to generate complexity. So here, through a single nozzle, you can have multiple um, uh, different inlets which can have different materials. So you can build these structures in a layer by layer manner, not just uh, with particular architecture, but with particular chemical or biological uh, composition as well. So we can actually add on to these types of approaches. Uh, here you can have uh, a printer with seven inlets, uh, where in, in this case, you can actually combine these different inlets in different combinations, whether they're individual or binary or tertiary, et cetera. So you can literally get hundreds and thousands of combinations um, through this simple process where you can mix these um, individual comp components. And where you can push this is actually now uh, take these types of technologies um, and um, build more complex um, architectures out of them. Here you can see some examples of where we're heading, where we're actually trying to uh, generate more complex structures that can be down the road be used for making more um, advanced biological uh, structures that can help the cells reorganize themselves further. So what I've shown so far are basically these um, extrusion or nozzle based printers, but there's a whole category of materials which are also more based on light patterning or stereolithographic systems. And we can use the same kind of principles to make these materials, um, these printers also multi-material. So here what you can see is that uh, we can pattern a light um, in a particular shape onto a surface and cross-link this material. But wh while we do that, we can also change the, um, the ink that is exposed to that plane um, so that once we have a particular shape printed, then we can bring in the second ink and then be able to subsequently make a um, second, um, um, a second material there with a different composition. So by using this approach, again, we can build um, in a layer by layer manner, be able to build the layer and then change the material and then build um, a second layer and generate the same kind of complex structures that I mentioned in these 3D printers. And where we think this addresses a lot of challenges is that when you're trying to build particularly tissues, um, you need to build with a certain level of complexity because you have different cells and different materials and different parts of the tissue. So having this kind of ability is going to be really powerful for uh, the next generation of tissue engineering. The other thing that I want to quickly talk about is how we can apply these engineered hydrogels to uh, different types of drug delivery applications. And particularly, I've become very fascinated by uh, micro needle array technology because they are painless ways of delivering uh, drugs through barriers like the skin. And uh, by doing that, they really allow us to 
um, address a lot of different ch challenges, everything from cosmetic and um, anti-aging applications to things related to uh, diabetes care and many other sorts of things. So when we think about these micro needles, they're typically made from polymers that are not really hydrophilic. Uh, these are polymers that are often degradable, or on the other end, they're made from um, actual metallic components. So we've been interested in actually taking this um, existing tool set and bringing in a new platform of hydrogels uh, to this. So when you think about hydrogels, you don't typically think of things that are strong to penetrate the skin. But what we can do is that we can actually take hydrogel um, of different, um, uh, different types of gels, like, for example, photocrossable gelatins or pegs, um, be able to mold them into the shape of these microneedles. And then we have these microneedles that are basically um, water sw swollen. So normally they wouldn't have the ability to penetrate the skin, but once we actually dry these or um, lyophilize these, um, um, then they actually get uh, the, the right kind of uh, mechanical properties and we can encapsulate many different things inside them and they can be used to penetrate the skin and deliver their cargo. So here's some examples of these um, very, very um, interesting hydrogel microneedles. And what you can see is that um, they not only have the right kind of um, architectures that we want, but we can put different types of drugs in them. These are some psychedelic drugs that, um, that some of our collaborators have been um, interested in. And we can take these microneedle patches and um, deliver them through different epithelial tissues. And when we actually come in and, um, and cr cross-section these tissues, we can see where the tissue has been penetrated. And we can now start using them for different applications. Of course, when you have hydrophilic drugs um, or, or, or things that are, can be immobilized inside these hydrogels, that's, that's very easy. But there's also classes of hydrophobic drugs that we want to incorporate. So there we can actually start making different types of um, um, approaches. In this case, we can get um, cy cyclodextran uh, molecules, conjugate them to our, 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 our background uh, polymer, and be able to encapsulate drugs directly inside them. And I do apologize for the background noise. Obviously, my uh, four-year-old um, is um, starting to learn how to sing. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, the, so what we can do with these now polymers that have the ability to encapsulate hydrophobic drugs is to also um, encapsulate them um, inside these uh, molds and be able to make these microneedles. And here's a, just a typical example of a drug um, that's very hydrophobic uh, called curcumin. And we can actually um, take um, these drugs encapsulated inside these um, um, hydrogel microneedles and then be able to um, use it in, in a uh, sample tumor um, example where we can actually uh, look at different controls when we have um, nothing inside the microneedle where, where we have just a plain sheet without the microneedles or when we actually have the microneedles is the only case that we can actually get cell death in this tumor models. Um, there's other types of applications we can do and um, examples of them include being able to add a lot of um, uh, gene and uh, gene delivery or, or micro, uh, mRNA um, aspects. And these are some other um, capability, which is very important. Um, and here we can do the same thing to be able to deliver genes to, um, to different cells um, inside this um, um, rodent models. And again, the very um, powerful examples here where we don't get any um, delivery using the um, using um, um, other types of controls, but when we have the the DNA with the um, the, the uh, cationic uh, delivery mechanism and the micro needle, you start getting um, expression of this um, a green pro a green fluorescent protein gene. And there's just want to give one quick example at the end. One is that uh, we want to be able to deliver other things other than drugs. And this is one approach where we can actually deliver cells using microneedles, again, because we have hydrophilic um, components. In this case, we can actually encapsulate the cells inside 
the gel, keep the gel hydrated for the entire process, uh, coat it with a thin layer of a PLGA, which allows it to maintain its strength and penetrate the skin. And then once the cells are delivered, then we can remove the back uh, substrate here and have the cells um, um, get penetrated into the skin. And these are some examples showing that we can actually deliver cells that can um, uh, secrete VEGF. And um, in this case, when we have an injury model, we can actually have um, these cells, um, 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 which are here, be able to kind of have significantly better outcomes um, compared to all the other controls where you don't have the cells or, or other types of controls. And these are just other biological characterizations for this. Um, we can use these also for fluid extraction. Um, um, be able to put these inside the skin and then sample different types of um, interstitial fluid components. Um, and here we demonstrate that we can, um, because these are dried gels, they can wick up a uh, solution from underneath the skin without any pain. Um, and we can take these samples um, and extract the fluid from them and then be able to actually use these to sample everything from glucose, to um, different types of proteomics, um, to um, uh, antibiotics like vancomycin, et cetera, and then be able to um, analyze the interstitial fluid and be able to actually sense these different ingredients and to be able to compare how their um, blood versus um, interstitial fluid samples are. So with that, I wanna end the talk and just loop back and we say that we do think that there is a lot of opportunity to integrate materials um, into precision um, medical applications. And um, I've given some examples in making tissues um, and also um, devices um, aspect. There's a lot of other um, applications uh, here as well. So with that, I'll just end off with this um, picture, which is a, um, I think is really uh, awesome painting. One of my favorite, uh, it's a self portrait of Rene Magritte which is a painting or a painter around the turn of last century. Um, he's looking at the egg and is drawing the bird. And I think um, a lot of the grand challenges that we're talking about here and other forums, um, we should kind of be looking at them as, um, as the egg because we should be able to find a solution and then um, have the bird that's emerging from it. Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers and uh, Molly um, and for your time. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ali, for the wonderful presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Molly to, to join as well. And so thank you all for adhering to the time because we did save um, enough time for some questions. And because of the outstanding presentations, we did get quite a few questions. So we'll see which ones we have the time to go through. And so I'll start um, with, with you, Molly, first. Um, a question that came in. Um, with the, the SPARTA, it's an exciting analytical tool enabling single particle analysis. Can you expand this tool to more high throughput analysis of an entire nanoparticle population? Yeah, so um, you definitely can. So, so the way it works is we trap an individual single nanoparticle. Um, and if we have a good uh, trap, we go on to acquire a high signal to noise uh, acquisition of the data for that, but then we release it and then we trap another particle and you can keep doing that for hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of particles. So you can do actually high throughput analysis, but with single particle resolution. And I um, uh, didn't go into that in my talk, but it's a great question. Yeah. Excellent, great. And we'll, we'll rotate here. So now to, to, to you, Ali. Um, the, the work on you know, kind of multifunctional uh, materials and 3D printing was really exciting. But one of the questions that came in is if you can comment on say, maybe challenges around interfacial adhesion when you have multi-component uh, materials. Yeah, so, so um, excellent question. I think uh, there's definitely um, aspects in material science that needs to be optimized for any time you want to do something like this. Um, for example, um, if you print materials um, that are inherently have different viscosities or, or uh, different hydrophobicity, there is optimization that needs to be made. Um, and similarly, I think um, if you're, if you're um, not very careful with um, how your um, hardware is, then that ad adds additional challenges. So th there are some optimization, but I think the concept um, is broadly applicable. Excellent, great. Um, we'll, we'll zoom out a little bit um, here, Molly, and a question for you um, in terms of if you could comment on kind of current state of the art of green synthesis of nanomaterials and nanoparticles, where we currently are. 
Um, I mean, I, I think I think it's really important in general. And, you know, this is something I was also quite involved in when I was um, a president of the um, one of the divisions within the UK Royal Society of uh, Chemistry. Um, you know, thinking about how we can make all of the science that we do uh, essentially more more sustainable and, you know, thinking uh, not only towards circular economy, but also um, just just start not having too many side effects, right, of the kind of materials we make. Um, so in general, the, the kind of materials that we are working on uh, uh, for most of our biosensing are, are sort of less to toxic and uh, also you only need a very tiny amount of them within the biosensing tests. Um, we definitely have done work uh, in the past on um, uh, using, for example, quantum dots that have different components. So uh, CAD selenide, zinc sulfide, for example, which, you know, would have a bit more uh, constraints uh, around them. But um, it's certainly the materials that we're thinking about um, for use in the point of care tests are um, are pretty well suited actually for that. So great, great. Uh, zoom out a little bit for you too as, as, as well, um, Ali. One of the questions was um, with the emergence of AI machine learning, how do you think that's going to impact or change um, discovery and application of new biomaterials? Oh, that's that's an excellent question. Um, so, so there's obviously a lot of interest in that space in the past few years. I, you know, I think um, as we start uh, really making new materials with different um, unique properties, and particularly for bio biological aspects, when there is lots of potential um, um, opportunity to use different types of uh, chemistries and different types of proteins. I think having the ability to use this um, um, AI machine learning is going to be really important. And I think it's some really exa amazing examples of it are the kind of work that you know, David Baker is doing and, and some of the other folks and in, in really um, looking at protein uh, chemistry and then being able to start in incorporating that into building uh, from, uh, from those building blocks. So I think it's, it's just the beginning of something really uh, exciting. Yeah, I might I might jump in as well, Ron. Please go ahead. Okay, because um, I'm sure Ali's seen this too. But um, you know, now all of the sort of grant panels that I sit on and so on, almost well, it's I'm sure it's not every proposal, but it seems like an awful lot of the proposals are, are incorporating some form of machine learning. You know, and really interesting. Um, uh, the the examples Ali's already mentioned, but also people, you know, how people are using AI to predict kind of how um, water repulsion might occur at different biomaterial surfaces, how proteins might adhere um, uh, differently. We, we're using it quite a lot um, in our own research as well to try and understand um, data sets, actually, really complex data sets. If you do biosensing in a target agnostic manner for many, many patients and you have huge data sets, how can you use uh, machine learning approaches to deconvolute um, basically the information that you want to gain from those uh, systems. And so, you know, it is it is also the case that with a lot of these machine learning approaches, um, actually, they've been around a, a long time, right? They just used to be called different things. <laughs> and people have used Gaussian processes and so on for a really long time. But but really, um, the data that you put into these things is just as important as the actual approach in many instances. Excellent, excellent. So before we jump into more technical questions, I'll zoom out even a little bit more. I mean, and this question addressed to both of you. Both are doing you know, outstanding fundamental research, but with huge technological implications. And you are involved in the translation of that work. And Molly, you mentioned the consortium with 10 plus institutions and, and Ali right now, and you're at a private um, um, institution right now. Can you talk a little bit about just the, the academic landscape and going from research to innovation and entrepreneurship and, and how you see that evolving in say the field of biotechnology, biomaterials, et cetera? Any challenges or lessons you've learned that you can share with the audience in translating basic fundamental research into actual applications that can have an impact on society? Yeah. Molly, you go first. Okay, yeah, and then I'll hand over uh, to some of the things you're doing at Terasaki. Um, so um, I'm I'm very actively involved in translation, and I'm also uh, been involved in the the founding of a, a number of um, companies. Um, and um, so I, I think it's hugely important, actually, that the knowledge we take in the lab we translate um, 
uh, into things that can actually help people. And there's, there's different ways of doing that, right? So we've done that within my own group. We've done that through founding of companies. We've also done it from large, uh, through large industrial uh, partnerships with large uh, companies. And we also are working really closely with organizations like the Gates uh, Foundation to, um, to kind of push some of that work uh, forwards uh, as well. I think in general, like this is not an easy thing to do. And so um, it is really important to think about the systems that you want to have in place. Um, one of the ways that I've um, helped to uh, do this for my kind of wider community is, is as I mentioned, by directing this large uh, multi-university hub that brings on those kind of external um, experts and there's different ways of doing this but um i'll hand over to ali as well because i'm actually on the advisory board of his terasaki institute and i think they also have a, a really interesting model there so go for it ali yeah thank you molly um so i think this is really a, a something that i've been thinking about for the past like 20 years just being in bob langer's lab who's like the pioneering um academic innovator i do think that there are some uh, basic things to follow one is that I think the, the area that you're going after is going to be really important. The kind of impact that you're going to make is going to be based on the kind of questions that you're trying to answer and how impactful those solutions will be. Um, and then fundamentally, the whole academic entrepreneurship is something that we're not trained in. So it does take a long time to really understand um, and get educated. And it took me 20 years, or I'm still learning, to be honest. Um, but, but the other thing is um, having a... Um, ecosystem that's um, tailored for that and supports that, I think is really important. Um, the, the reason the Terasaki Institute was formed was to really enable that. So we ask our faculty that, um, listen, you know, innovation is our mission. So uh, we don't ask you to teach. We don't ask you to, to do many other service types of things. But in return, we want you to really just solve big problems and be able to um, be involved in the process of taking it uh, to the real world. So, so I do, it is something that is a new exercise in academic entrepreneurship, but I do think that it's something that needs to be done more and more um, at um, across the world, really. Uh, Great, thanks for that. And, and with that question, we are officially done with the Q&A um, part of this webinar. So I'd like to now turn it back over to my colleague, Stephanie. Uh, thank you so much, Rodney. Uh, thank you for that really stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, I appreciate the fact that we had uh, so many people here um, in the audience checking in from, from all over the world and just a lot of real inspiration um, uh, from these talks. Um, so I just wanna thank again, our innovators in bioengineering, uh, Molly Stevens and Ali Karam Hosseini for sharing with us their thoughts on some of these grand challenges uh, that, that particularly are facing um, materials for, for therapeutics. Uh, I hope that this webinar has inspired you as, as it has me and, and really broadened your perspective of what, uh, what the future of medicine looks like. Uh, I also hope um, that uh, in your work um, resulting in novel, interesting new um, bioengineered materials that you will consider uh, Jack's Gold and ACS Materials Gold for your next best manuscript. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.